edge of the Daintree rainforest and Australian civilization. This magical place is a fragment of Atlantis, for it escaped the volcanic holocaust, so now shelters primitive plants and animals existing when Australia was joined to the landmass of India, Africa and South America a few hundred million years ago, before this island floated away from that supercontinent of Gondwana. Most of northern Queensland is still as Captain James Cook first saw it in 1770. And surprisingly, it's in these rustling fields of sugar cane at the very end of the line that Australia's overseas reputation in the arts was born. In the 50s, when its dramatic output was not internationally known, one of Australia's first successful exports was a play about cane cutters called Summer of the 17th Doll, which first told world audiences something about life down under. The rainforest still appeals to dramatists, still attracts those who may be slightly out of step. In Mossman, the last little town before Cape Tribulation, there's a nice sense of local values in their professional pecking order. Today, the few residents of this ancient rainforest have been joined by a new and otherworldly species. A future community on 200 isolated acres at Mayello, where an actress once married to Sean Connery teaches an holistic approach to the 20th century. Diane Chalento arrived here 10 years ago from Putney, where she was Mrs. James Bond, and a Gloucestershire commune, where she was guru. She's now Mrs. Anthony Schaffer. He gave up practicing law after losing an undefended divorce action for a client, but went on to write the overpowering play Sleuth. Fascinated by murder, he attended the trial of the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, before coming to this emerald incongruity to write about sudden death and get married. Diane came back here to her roots, really. She finds her roots here. What do you find here? Well, um, her, chiefly. <laughs> Not a bad <laughs> discovery. What else? Well, that was sufficient. And if Hollywood thought you were living here, they would assume you were dead, wouldn't they? Well, I think, I think they probably do anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this contributes to that moribundity. And um, I think from time to time, it is necessary to walk up and down uh, Hollywood Boulevard or Sunset just to assure people that one is still breathing. Yes. Um, yes. It's something that one's agent demands. Um, so one goes there and just walks about. How did you sneak sleuth uh, before them? In oh, well, case? no one knew me then, you see. So I, You could get away with murder. That's right. You could get away with murder. Get away with murder, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I mean, do they expect you to come here and uh, uh, and create? I mean, to me, this is such a relaxing place. Even the, I mean, the, tro the tropics are known for lying around in, aren't they? Not for getting up and going in. But it's, it isn't like that all the time, honestly. But Tony's writing is particularly sophisticated, yes, is it true. not? In, uh, in a good sense. That's why uh, he gets on so well with the Australians. <laughs> ah. See, they think he's a wonderful caricature of an Englishman. <laughs> He's about to... <laughs> Which shows exactly how far from the truth they are. <laughs> on this subject is indeed on all others. <laughs> no, but you know, when you have friends in, as it were, here, um, I, do, you, do you step down from the dinner table uh, stimulated? It depends what we've been eating, I think. <laughs> <laughs> See, sleuth um, was really about sadism and humiliation, in a way. Was it not? The murderer is even uh, more macabre, I'm, I'm led to understand. Uh, whereas this is the kind of place where uh, one feels relaxed and benevolent, and the worst thing that can happen to you is have a coconut fall on your head. You're, you're sitting here in your ivory tower thinking fiendish thoughts. No, fiendish indeed, fiendish. <laughs> um, both those plays were written actually first time round um, away from here. Murder, it is true, has been rewritten here and has become even more fiendish, I think, <laughs> uh, than it was the first time round. But, uh, it's that it's terrible also... meal you had the other evening. That's what it was. Um, you do have this fascination for murder, do you not? I mean, you sat in on the Sackliff trial. Yes. 
Yes, it's true. Um, I wanted to see what that little fellow was about. And I think, I don't know how I uh, imagine I was going to do that, because what you're looking at is a guy who's about five foot two who looks as if butter wouldn't melt in his mouth, or indeed in the mouths of anyone around him. But it was a lot more that melted when he was operating. Yeah. And, and the curious thing uh, about that man is that he was plainly completely schizophrenic. Um, he could do what he did with his nasty little bag of, of tricks, his hammer and his chisel and and uh, his other ghastly implements, and then return to his wife and say, well, where's my cocoa? And forget totally, and I think he did forget totally what uh -huh. he had done, because he's, he's not a tremendously good actor from what I saw, and that's what I wanted to find out. Mm -hmm. My point is that your interest in the macabre can hardly be stimulated in this placid atmosphere. Not true. Ah. Not true. Hidden depths in those dark that's primeval true. forests, right? Oh, in, indeed, hidden depths, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Oh, yes, there's a certain Wagnerian ring to that up there. Yes. You can't see it all. You can't yes. see it, no. Yes. Now, it is a, a very peculiar place here because we have ladies eaten by crocodiles and things that nobody knows how it all happened. Didn't you know that? Ah, yes, indeed, yes. yes. These yes. sort of things yes. go on and then the, then the wonderful rumble of what happens after that. I mean, all those things are, are quite delicious to Tony's, stimulating oh, yeah. so to Tony's. That's the question of it. You see, Tony, you've been a lawyer, an advertising man, a world-famous dramatist. These are professions uh, which demand wit, really. Now, is there a stimulus here? Um, not a lot. Um, you take a, the case of a world-famous wit, I suppose Mr. Oscar Wilde would come high on that list. And, um... Quite recently, at a dinner party in this very house, I did suggest to a man who wanted to sue someone uh, that um, if he did that, he might find himself over his head by someone suing him, being forced to because of the def defamatory nature of what he had suggested. And he would find himself in the same position as Oscar Wilde. Who, he said? <laughs> if this begins yeah. to indicate to you the difficulty sometimes at these dinner parties of making anything of a... Uh, world statement or a witty remark that depends on something or something to be known further south than Cairns, uh, you'll be right. So it is, is, it's heavy going some nights. This is a pull up the drawbridge place for you, is it? Well, very much so. Mm. Um, we do rely on visiting firemen quite a lot in that way and people do come here and are increasingly coming here. And in fact, I think we're going to get far too many of them. <laughs> um, in view of local developments, it's becoming a very big um, a tourist uh, area. And um, I don't know that the standard of wit is going to increase enormously because we have 11,000 Japanese dumped in our laps. <laughs> um, possibly, if I learn Japanese, <laughs> it might prove so, but I doubt it. Avid followers of sport and Japanese holidaymakers head straight for Queensland's Gold Coast, south of Brisbane, where not even the annual four million visitors can fill broad beaches where sun worshippers queue to be sprayed with oil. And every 15 minutes, the local radio warns them it's time to turn over. Australia's Miami sells year-round sunshine and after dark, the glitz and glitter of an undemanding nightlife. This nightclub is owned by Paul Sharrett from Wolverhampton, who began his showbiz career with the Ramblers concert party on Clacton Pier. In 1960, he arrived in Australia to do his act in the RSL poker machine clubs and found he could earn more in one weekend than in three months in England. Now, in his own club at Surfers Paradise, dancing with his wife, he presents shows not unlike those early ones on good old Clacton Pier. What does the average Australian look for when he comes on holiday? How does he have a good time? I think it depends which time of the year you're looking at. When you get this big 
division between the times of the year. Uh, we get uh, the Jewish community come up from Melbourne during the June, July, August, getting away from the Melbourne winter. So they're looking for sort of average theatre, restaurant entertainment, and they like to go to good restaurants and they enjoy that and come in large groups. Then you get a... Well, they're spenders, I presume. They are spenders, yes. They used to, because they come from Victoria, where they have to pay for their entertainment. They haven't got RSL clubs, so they, they, they're used to paying for it and they don't mind paying for it. Want individual bills, of course, always, but they do pay for it. Uh, and then you've got the Christmas time when the families come. We say they, they come mostly from Brisbane here to the Gold Coast. That's 80% probably of our Christmas time business is, is the families from Brisbane. And we say they bring $5 and a pair of underpants and they don't change either. <laughs> What sort of a comedy do they appreciate here? I mean, it's, it's got to be broader. Has it's it? much is it, broader. Is it Benny Hill? Uh, is it, yeah, uh, it's broad and it's bumps gags. And One liners are not very successful. One liners are not, they don't react instantly. They like a, a build up and a good tag. One that whilst they're enjoying themselves, they can, uh, you know, work on and then the tag comes and it's a good laugh. A bit slower, you're saying? Yeah, I, think a a bit slower. Slower. I think a bit slower, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Visual, they like visual comedy. Do you find that jokes about pommies are still the mainstay of a, of, a, of a comedian's routine? Oh no, not at all. I mean, this is really very noticeable in the last few years. When I first came here, 25 years ago, every comic in every television show had said, you know, the car, it, we went to the Lion Park and it was $4 per car, poms on bicycles admitted free. And that everybody did sort of pom jokes to her. Uh, but that's dropped a lot, I find. Uh, and it's not so much, I think we're becoming much more international. The Gold Coast now is becoming a very big place for Japanese people to have their honeymoon. They come here in aeroplanes full, you know, 200 couples all on their honeymoon together and then they go everywhere together and they go to see the, our topless uh, review and that's exciting. Then they go home and then they never see their wives again for the rest of their lives. Now, these days, it's hard to escape the feeling that a lot of British acts that come here are really on the downgrade, actually. They've come here because they're not commanding an audience at home. I think that it's good that they should come here and that Australians should enjoy, uh, you know, the best of British acts, even, even if they're, maybe there's not the market for them now in Britain anymore. See, I don't see the Australians as very sentimental people, actually. I mean, uh, are they nostalgic? Oh, I think they are. They, they oh. would like you to think that they're not, I'm sure, and they... But all of a sudden, in the last four or five years, six years, maybe even ten, you've seen this, this pride in the country beginning to grow. I realise something I've always loved. I still call Australia home. I do the song, I still call Australia home, uh, in the show. I would never have done that five years ago. And I have nights here when the whole audience stand up and sing that. And this is a, 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 a new experience in, in a country that I thought didn't have a great pride in itself. Suddenly they've, they've sort of gained a pride. And we're a long way from everything associations with Britain seem to get less and less as the years go by. We stand our own two feet even in things like Anzus. We break from New Zealand and we go on our own. But I think now the Australian feels we have to sort of have an identity and a pride. And it's, it's been a wonderful experience to be here during that, uh, that feeling. Australians have always been ill at ease with the pageantry of patriotism and, except on Anzac Day, shown a distrust of flag wavers. But as the country enters its third century of European settlement, the resurgence of national pride has been reinforced by the celebration of this year-long birthday party. I still now, along with such patriotism, comes a growing appreciation of art, best displayed 450 miles south of the Gold Coast in Sydney.
Despite the state of the market, big corporations are sponsoring exhibitions, and Australia's new tycoons have started collecting, hesitantly approaching the Impressionists by way of early colonial, usually through this temple to culture and discrimination. The Art Gallery of New South Wales is now directed by a dapper guru from Orpington who's tried to humanise the institution and stop it intimidating the locals. His innovations include a free bus service and parties for taxi drivers so they'll know how to find the place. Edmund Capon, formerly an assistant keeper at the Victoria and Albert, took over in 1978 and says three quarters of his time is spent as an impresario raising money. This urbane hunt for publicity has increased the gallery's annual attendance from 400,000 to a million. Though it's not been easy to lure people into this artistic world to prize them away from the football and those beaches. But Edmund Capon's convinced Australia would be a far better place if people devoted as much time to their minds as they do to their bodies. Do you find that, uh, that Australians enjoy art? Yeah. Are you making them feel guilty for not enjoying? I don't want to make anybody feel guilty about anything unless they owe me money. They, what, the, I, I think they do enjoy art. I mean, I really do. They also enjoy what art sort of means and the place art has in, in society. They're tremendous collectors. There's not a house, I, I guarantee, that you will go to in Sydney that hasn't got paintings all over the place. Yeah. They'll all be Australian paintings, most of them. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we've got to do now is sort of um, broaden the horizons a little bit of their collecting instincts. See, I, get, I, I get the impression it's like wine, that they didn't discover wine until like 20 years ago. Now they can't get enough of it. <laughs> the same with art, perhaps. Well, I yeah. think it is. I mean, the, 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 the art market in Australia really is booming. And we've had our first million dollar Australian painting. And there are living artists who are getting up well over $100,000 for their pictures. Brett Whiteley and Nolan, people like that. And that's, that's really quite a substantial market to support it. The trouble with it is that it has absolutely no market outside Australia. It's a very sort of close national market. Yeah. If I'd come here when I came my first visit, I looked at a painting like that. I said, OK, yeah, that's a nice painting. It's, it tells you about Australian history and all that. Here's the bush ranger and all the agony and the pain and the loneliness of being that. But in a sort of semi-romantic way, now these are much more than that. These sort of things are icons in people's history here. Yeah. So you've got to, you've got to yeah. adjust to that. Yeah. And uh, but, well, socially, of course, Sydney is one of the most uh, active and gregarious places imaginable. I mean, you can, you can go out to three parties a night here. You don't never have to buy any food or drink if you really want to. You were a social lion, yeah. aren't you? Um, well, cat. Heterosexual, <laughs> intelligent male. Uh, you, can have a you can have a good time here. Yes, scarce, it's, good. Scarce. Yes, it's, it's yeah. a great place. Rara Avis. For that. Um, I mean, the, some of the, the great names in Australian art did their best paintings when they went to Europe for that first experience of Europe in the late 19th, early 20th century. These are century European paintings, but done by Australians. Mm. And they're, they're very rich, uh, and I think they're marvellous pictures. I'm not familiar with Mr. Bunny. Is he, is he known? Uh... Rupert Bunny is a, is a, a prolific painter. Mm. We must have got 40 or 50 of his paintings here. Yeah. Not all this size, I tell you. Yeah. I hasten to add. Yeah. But this one, I mean, when I started, I had to learn about Australian art. I mean, I really didn't know anything about it. Yeah. But this one, I looked at that, I thought, my God, we've got a, we've got a Manet in the collection. Yes, yes, and yes. Unfortunately, that's not the case. But not quite, but it's, a, it's still a, a, an interesting use of Australian light, isn't yeah. it? You, never, light you is never, it. never escape that. Yes, wonderful. Sure. Now, the life otherwise, I don't know. What about uh, the sexual mores here, for example? We were talking about you being the sole surviving heterosexual <laughs> in Sydney. Well, <laughs> well, that's pretty free, too. I mean, I think... I, I have this theory about Sydney, that it's suffering from premature decadence, uh, which, uh, you know, decadence can really only be achieved after you've gone up right at the top of the great cultural ladder and plopped off the end, like uh, Greece and Rome, uh, and French, of course. Um, Sydney put the ladder, the cultural ladder there, went up two or three steps and said, oh, this is wonderful, let's get into that nice pool of decadence, and popped off rather early. And that's my theory of premature decadence here. And, 
it, it's, it's a very hedonistic city. Do you find that a lot of your uh, benefactors, your patrons, are people who had to go abroad to be accepted, as it were, the old traditional thing? Yeah, the that, uh, that notion is still pretty strong here, the idea that if you're really going to make it, you have to go overseas to make it, then come back. But the strange thing there is that there's a sort of resentment about the fact you have to go away in the first place to make your yes. name in this or that. It, it happens uh, uh, all the time. It, it hasn't really happened in the art business, except with people like, you know, like Nolan. Sid Nolan. Yes. Uh, there are very few Australian painters who are known overseas. Sid Nolan would probably be the, the best known of them all. And he's now moved into designing opera sets and things yeah, like so that. Yeah, he, he sort of peaked early, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yes, I think a lot of people do that. There's one wonderful painter here who's 92. And still painting away. He's painting marvellous pictures. Now, there are a few of his overseas, but very few. Now, do you detect, as a palm here, as an artistic palm here, do you detect any xenophobia in Australian society? Yes. Sydney society? Yeah, I think, I think there is. How um, does it show itself? In, well, in, in our business, I suppose, in the collecting of purely Australian art. I mean, that's one way. Yeah. I said so, to so you earlier, you, know, you go to all these houses, they're just full of Australian art. Yeah. Like Australian paintings, few Australian films won much international praise until the 70s, when critics, having always seen the Antipodes as a cultural desert and home of the Technicolor yawn, began to appreciate a new sensitivity. The film industry was also doing well financially thanks to unusually generous tax breaks for investors. So the high earners and the starstruck jostled to become angels. Diving eagerly into this flood of money and talent, Philip Emmanuel from Manchester has already made a splash. His father knew he was stage struck, but also knew that any nice Jewish boy should be a lawyer or a doctor at least. So Philip met him halfway and graduated in pharmacy. With a chemist shop to fall back upon, he reverted to showbiz and, in 1978, came out here with a touring show for six months and stayed. Now, this set of yours looks like Psycho. Yes, it does, and that's the intention. So uh, we've got a comedy uh, ghost story being shot here at the moment, and uh, that facade would cost about half a million dollars if we tried to build it, and the people that own this house have rented it to us for 2000 so that's how it's done in Australia. So you've got to watch your, you've got to watch your dollars. Well, this uh, budget is very, very tight. We're making this uh, uh, for a million dollars Australian, which is incredibly low. How we're doing it for that sort of money, God only knows. People are working for minimum. Pamela Stevenson starring in his third feature film, a black comedy about a haunted house where mischievous spirits disturb the chandeliers. But apart from some extremely successful Australian films, most of them are still on the art house circuit, aren't they? Australians have a perception of their films I don't feel is strictly accurate because the press here are, 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 very, are, are in fact blowing them out of all proportion. They're not as well received overseas as the press here would have us believe I know yes. because I'm going overseas and getting reactions first hand. That is not to say they do not make good films here. They do. They make excellent films and there is a, a high standard of excellence achieved here. But no, they're not widely successful. Only a handful have, have done anything at all outside of these shores. You see, it's strange that the Australians like to export the, the Paul Hogan image, and then they get rather affronted that they're not seen as thoughtful intellectuals. Yes. But to be fair to them, there have been a number of films made by directors such as Bruce Beresford and Fred Skepsey and Gillian Armstrong, which have been uh, remarkable films. I'm talking about Gallipoli and The Break of Morant and My Brilliant Career and Pitney and Hanging Rock, yes. where, where there is a considerable amount of intellectual content and very, and very good films and have something to say. And so there so is real talent here? Uh, no it? question. And, and, it's, and as far as the arts are concerned, it's all concentrated in the feature film area and that's where I'm happily involved. Do you feel at home here, Philip, after, after eight years? Feel at home? Not entirely, no. I don't feel that I belong here. Um, I've, my roots being somewhere else, I feel uh, wedded to the UK. I'm enjoying myself here. I have a good lifestyle here. I've done well here. But I think if I'm being perfectly honest, I don't feel at one with Australia or Australians because um, for some reason I'm not relating as well to them as I'd hoped I might. I felt that way when I first arrived and I still feel that way. Yet, I mean, this is a splendid base, isn't it? Sure. Uh, you, professionally, you're doing well, as you sure. say. Uh, you're living in a, a very handsome way. Sure. 
You've obviously got a lot of friends here as well. But Indeed. you still feel transient, do you? I, I do, I do. I feel... Um, I, don't, I can't put my finger on it, but I feel in a way that uh, I'm not relating, as I've said, to, to Australians, either in an intellectual sense or a cultural sense, uh, as well as I'd hope that I might. When you come here, you feel... I knew nothing about Australia, although I married an Australian, and I honestly believed it was going to be like England, but hot. And, of course, it isn't, and Australians are a different race and a different... And it's, you have to get used to a different country, a different way of life, and it doesn't altogether appeal to me. Now, having said that, of course, yes, as you say, we're doing well, and, of course, there's a lot about the lifestyle I like, and I'm enjoying myself, but if I'm being perfectly honest, I think I'd be more at home emotionally in, uh, in the UK. What do you miss? Oh, well, I miss... I just miss the general way of life. I, I miss the um, accessibility to world-class theatre, uh, the, the, the television there. I prefer, I prefer the drama there on television. I prefer the informed opinion. Uh, politically that one can, can glean at any, any, any minute. I prefer the newspapers there. I don't particularly enjoy Australian newspapers. What about, I don't miss the climate. No, <laughs> I don't miss the climate and I don't miss the fact that you can't, you can't do what I'm doing, which is make films. You can't make films in, in the UK. It's very hard, anyway, to raise the money, of course. Whereas here, what's helped me is the fact that the government several years ago unbelievably introduced an amazing tax incentive scheme uh, to encourage people to invest in feature films. And I came to Australia at a time when that was just beginning to happen. So, in fact, what I've got going for me is a, a fantastic um, uh, incentive for investors who, will get, who used to get 150% deduction on their, on their money. Now it's 120 and people are complaining. 120% write-off. Is this after the, after the some of the concessions have been cut? It's still 120? It's still 120%. Uh -huh. uh, and the first 20% income is tax-free. So... Um, it, that's what we've got going for us here. It's not even a question of being plausible. It's a question of, yes, being able to put together a package that, um, that can find its way into the marketplace, but it, it's, and it's not easy. But with that sort of incentive, it's certainly not as hard as it is anywhere else in the world. And that's See, why I've stayed, and that's why we're making films. Now, you, as a family man, I mean, you've got, you've got these two pretty daughters, your wife's here, you've got a lovely house. She's hand. pretty too. It's a satisfactory, it's a satisfactory domestic life. Oh, oh, absolutely. I don't know how you top it, really. Well, you can't. We're very happy. But, I mean, we'd be just as happy as a family anywhere, because we're a happy family. And, uh, and I suspect I'd be emotionally and intellectually happier uh, where the back, back where, where I belong, which is, which is the United Kingdom. My wife belongs here and loves it now and has a, a beautiful family and is close to it. My kids love it here. That's the dilemma. But as long as, uh, as, long as the government keep uh, shining on us with their tax incentive schemes and as long as the dollar for film is rolling, and it still is, and as long as I'm making films, uh, I'd be crazy to move as much as I would possibly want to. And turn over. Gary, so film production flourishes in Sydney. Right, Yet this city of three and a half million people has only three theatres. <laughs> Melbourne's believed to be more serious about the stage, so it's here that one of Australia's youngest impresarios is starting a long tour of state capitals with the two veteran stars he's brought out from London and New York. Arriving in Australia in 1973 at the age of 21, he's since produced a number of hits and flops, but scored his greatest financial success not with one of these urbane revivals, but with the Rocky Horror Show. He's just spent five months escorting Lauren Bacall and applause around Australia. Wilton Morley, who predictably looks like a younger version of his father Robert, is now back upon that theatrical escort treadmill, so I wondered how he was getting along with his crotchety well, star. I mean, Rex is not young. I mean, he's 78, and he, he spends a lot of time in the hotel, and then he has to come and do the show. Uh, I think he, he, finds, he finds the women here extraordinary. I mean, he thinks that, that, the, the, that the country is run by rather fierce middle-aged women, which it probably is. And he thinks it's extraordinary that the men are all either rather timid or rather gay, or both. But, I mean, I, that is the general misconception about Australia, that it is run by men in shorts running along Bondi Beach. And, of course, it's not. <laughs> 
the Australian women are quite fierce and do really kind of run the country. What did your father make of it when he came? He likes out? Australia for the first 10 minutes, and then when he can't get the news or he can't get the story that he's been following in England the week before, and he gets annoyed that every newspaper has a bathing beauty or a dog being born or something on the front page, then he gets irritated with it. So he likes it for about a week, and then he gets bored and he wants to go off. How do you find it personally? Do you well, find I it love a better place here, to I love the climate, and I came when I was 21, and it's, you know, it's been very good to me. I've made a nice living here, and I can get back to England when I want to. And I, you know, I, I, I like the, the way of life. I'm not, I'm not a terribly hard worker, and I find the idea of going to the beach in the afternoon quite nice. I mean, it's a Mediterranean climate. It's a Mediterranean way of life. They don't, you know, they have a kind of she'll be right attitude. There's not a lot of competition here. There's not a lot of people producing plays. It's a nice living. I understand it. I've been doing it for 10 years. There's something fun about taking a show to you know, Mount Isa or Alice Springs or New Zealand. I love traveling around it. We had the most extraordinary experience of taking uh, Rocky Horror Show to Mount Isa where they'd never had anything. I think they'd had, the man at the theater said they'd had Frank Ifield and Lay Girls in the last 10 years. I said, oh, well, that's, this is a cross between the two. I said, <laughs> you'll love this. But people would get up in the middle of the performance and, and kind of go out to the bar and have a drink and come back in as if it was a, uh, 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 you know, a, a wartime concert. From that. And uh, then the, the man who ran the theatre said, I hope you won't mind, I'm, I'm having a little wedding ceremony. I, I'm the registrar here. I'm marrying some people between the six o'clock and the nine o'clock show. Do you mind if I use the set? I mean, it was the kind of experience <laughs> that one wouldn't have missed for the world. You know, so you get, I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot of pioneering here, uh, you know, in a sense. <laughs> One of the, the universal complaints of immigrants here from all walks of life is a lack of culture. Australia. Yes, I think you give up certain things if you come to live here. I mean, I think what it has going for it is that there's a lot of spending money, and that relates to the theatre, because you're not relying upon your Japanese and your Americans to go. I mean, the people who go are the Australians, which I think, you know, I think it's easier probably to reach your audience. Uh, I think that there are, certainly you give up, the, the newspapers are awful, but now in England the newspapers are getting worse and worse and all owned by the same man, aren't they? So I mean, it doesn't, I don't know that they're, they're getting better, but one misses that a bit. One misses, you know, the proximity of Europe. Um, but then here you can go to Hong Kong or Japan or the Far East quite easily and that's all, in, you know, interesting. Yes, I think, you, I think that there is a certain lack of culture here. Sure, sure you give that up. You give that up for sunshine and money and pretty girls. <laughs> Television certainly is, seems curiously amateur and pleased with itself here. Is the theatre audience equally undemanding? I think they're probably less demanding, the theatre audiences, than they are in New York and London, that's true. But I think they may be more honest than they are in New York. I mean, you go to the theatre now in New York, they get up and applaud the, the, uh, the orchestra, the overture. You know, they have this extraordinary thing of leaping to their feet every five minutes because they've been told this is a wonderful play. This is a much realer audience. It's because I mean, they, they pay like so much money to get in. They don't give a stuff what, what, what the press say. Yes. I mean, no, no reviewer can close you overnight here. I mean, it, it works on word of mouth. If they, you know, so it's an honest audience. But yeah, sure, it's probably a little less sophisticated than it is. See, the Australian stars, like the Australian films, seem to me to be less good than they think they are. I do notice on television they're all very pleased with themselves. They all think that all Australian movies are absolutely wonderful, whereas in fact they are not. Well, this is a country, I mean, when I first came here, you know, as soon as you got off the plane, they said, how do you like Australia? I mean, they were terribly nervous of the fact that you were going to say, well, I don't like it as much as England. Now, you know, it infuriates them if you compare England to Australia. I mean, now there is this enormous nationalism here, and they don't care at all what anybody thinks. I mean, they think that this is a better country to live in than America and a better country to live in than England. In some ways it is, and in some ways it isn't. But there is a fervent nationalism, I think, ever since they won that silly uh, boat race in, uh, in Perth or wherever <laughs> it was in New York. I mean, I think the America's Cup probably started as much as anything else. Down in Hobart, one Londoner's so convinced the living's better here that in 15 years he's never once bothered to go home. Peter Barnard came straight from the Playboy Club with all its bunnies to Tasmania with all its sheep and loved it. 
He now keeps his yacht outside that casino behind us, where he's gambling director. Rest Point was the very first of the eight monstrous casinos that grew up across the land when the government decided nationwide gambling, carefully controlled, might be one answer to their economic problems. So the first casino was built, paradoxically, in this gentle green island where life is sane and subdued. In the early 70s, the Tasmanians sent to England for gambling men to come out and run the place. And Peter Barnard arrived with a plane load of other ex-Playboy Club pit bosses to launch the new scene. Here, and in another casino up at Launceston, they now turn over $100 million a year. So, though it may not look like it, there must be some high rollers around. I wondered how these gamblers differed from those he'd dealt with in London. Well, they like gambling at which they can't be embarrassed. Australians are, are the most uh, private people in the world. They refuse to be embarrassed. They won't uh, undertake anything at which they won't or don't understand or can't succeed at. You can't foist your ideas of what a person should play on them. They'll play what they want to play. They, everybody knows blackjack because it's pontoon or 21 that they played when they were in the army or at school or whatever. Uh, other games, two up, two up is the simplest game ever devised by man. You know, heads or tails. Yeah. That's it. You bet on the heads, you bet on the tails. Other games, like roulette, roulette is slightly more risque. That was accepted because the people had seen that in James Bond films. And, and the other thing is your croupiers all look to me as though they should be serving hamburgers at uh, McDonald's. I mean, mm. they're all kids with spiky hair. <laughs> I mean, they're not, they're not these, these guys in, in dinner jackets with dark glasses. Uh, but that's George Raff, George Raff and Vegas. Yeah. And that doesn't exist. If it did exist, people would never play with them. They'd never trust them. We, we demand certain standards now. We demand that a, a dealer or a person who comes in as a recruit has got level three matric. We demand that they have got a certain basic uh, skill of talking with each other, of, of uh, conversation. But they're the opposite of the heavies, aren't they? Oh, they yes, really they are. are. You they're... can't get away with that anymore. They're kids. Oh, that's right, they are. See, the so... thing is, I feel on both sides of the table, people are not street smart here. No, that's true. Yeah, when I look around at the tables, they look, it looks more like an old folks outing. <laughs> what am I supposed to say to that? I think they do. I, I really think that people here look as though they're enjoying themselves. Uh, I've, I've been in casinos where you get this dour, this somber, this cathedral-like atmosphere where if anybody should sort of start to whisper at all, they sort of go, shh, you know, none of that. Here we treat it as a place where people have a flutter. If they look like ordinary people, so be it. It's no longer exotic or glamorous. It's just uh, like going down to the bingo. Oh, no, I like to think that we provide, or that any casino should provide a difference you see, we're in a competition, competing against horses, dogs, the traps, bingo, tats, lotto. What we do is we give the best odds, cheapest rates, the most comfort, a little bit of glamour. Have you got much in common, do you think, now, with the people you left behind? With those croupiers in the I seem to find I haven't. I've talked to people that have come out. There's been a, a couple of cruise ships, the, um, the Queen Elizabeth, the QE2 was out here, and there was a few on the casino on that, there was a few people that I remembered from London. Uh, their minds have atrophied. Theirs, they, not yours? Theirs, no, theirs. Oh. They, they don't look out anymore. They think of uh, the casino and a party and, uh, and they, they haven't expanded at all, at least it seems to me. Minds are supposed to atrophy here in this Tasmanian mm, backwater. No, no, this is the time that they get a chance to breathe. There's certainly some deep breathing going on in this suburb of Sydney from a chap who, after the 1956 Hungarian uprising, fled with his mother to live in Bedfordshire. He grew up to become our golden boy of boxing, twice British and Commonwealth heavyweight champion, twice going the distance with Muhammad Ali. I was with him at the start of his third comeback, for Joe Bugner was then convinced he'd soon be world heavyweight champion and an Australian citizen. Well... One out of two can't be all bad. He'd left Britain after almost 30 years because, he says, the crowds and the press had been against him since this moment in 1971. He's given it to Joe Bugner, and I find that amazing. He's given it to Joe Bugner, and Cooper has lost three titles. 
So Bogna raises his arms and gets nothing but booze. A 21, a triple champion. But the poor young man does not have a friend in the house. Unfortunately for Joe, he'd beaten on points a London idol, Henry Cooper, and that's when the booing began. It's, it's a really been a, a very sad situation as far as I'm concerned with England. It's true, they are. They do still knock you. I noticed that when your, this return of yours uh, was announced, uh, one of the newspapers started a report saying, don't laugh, but... You know? I, I, I can't relate to the attitudes of these, uh, these people. For a simple reason, uh, they automatically assume at 36 you should have one foot in the grave. There was even one critic who turned around and said that I look like Adonis, <laughs> but as might as well have been a statue because I move slow, sl so slowly in the ring that uh, as far as they were concerned, you know, I may have been stiff. But if I beat guys being that slow, how slow must have those blogs been? I mean, you know, they, their thinking is not sensible. Uh, and I sometimes gave him credit when I was younger for being schooled and educated. But I take it all back now. I think they're all deals. Now, what about financially? I mean, are you, how, how are you off now? I'm very poor, Alan. I have a home in uh, England. I have a home in uh, California. I have a home here, and I'm very poor. I mean, you don't need the money. Is this what you're saying? Well, that, you, you... That, that would be a silly thing to say, Alan. I mean, I've, I've watched you all your career. <laughs> would you be doing this for free? <laughs> like hell. No, of course, I'm doing it for money as well. I'm doing it because I believe in myself first. And I'm doing it also because there's still a lot of money to be earned. I'd be stupid to turn and say to you, no, I'm not doing it for money. Of course I am. You see, by boxing standards, you're an old man. Am but I? you look in very good shape. I'm I... an old man, Alan. 36? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, no, I think you're as old as you, you want to be. And I don't believe that at 36 year old. But I mean, you decided you want to make a comeback, or did Marlene manipulate you into it? Marlene was dead against it right up to about three months ago. Absolutely against it. She said, Joe, she said, why are you trying to mess up your, your reputation? I said, honey, you can't, rest, you can't mess up something that is already has been established. I said, the only thing I'm going to do, I said, I'm going to do something that I want to do. Irrespective of the cynics, I'm going to do it. I said, for a simple reason, I believe in myself. I'm not going to give up just because some, some Burke says to me, you're too old or this or that and the other. I said, no, no. I'm going to do it because I believe in myself. And I think that at 36, I've got as much left as, let's put it this way, um, Frank Bruno. Sugar baby! Tonight, I'm with his equally formidable manager. Marlene's here to see her husband start yet another comeback, fighting the American James Tillis. But first, there's some local business for fight fans to consider. Wagner already calls himself Aussie Joe, and that a night he's dressed more like Aussie Liberace. He may have gone those few extra rounds with Father Time, but there's no doubt he's a popular figure in Australia. And during his long fighting life, Joe sadly has grown unaccustomed to cheers.
Yes, isn't he? You know, he's taking them on the ground. Okay, you want to be champion of Australia? I want to be champion of Australia and carry the flag for Australia. Fantastic. Um, you had the Australian flag there today and uh, one of your good friends, Christopher Essex, that's a pretty sexy looking dressing gown. Yeah, and I deserved it. Admittedly, uh, my face is not too pretty at the moment, but uh, it was well earned. It was a determined fight and uh, the, the gown makes up for it. Thanks very much, Joe Bagner. A tremendous performance tonight. Uh, was it worth it? Was it worth it? Alan, it was worth it. You saw what beautiful people these were. They backed me 100%, and the fact was that... Uh, now, what's the difference fighting here and fighting in England? You heard it, Alan. This, this crowd was with me, and that's, that's something that I've missed all my career. 20 years and 70 fights. For the first time in all these 70 fights, I've had my people behind me. So it was a great night for Joe and Marlene. Now, he went on to beat two more Americans, also on points, but then in London met Frank Bruno. Now he's retired to Sydney, relaxing after all those years of fights and fireworks. He's found Australia a warm and welcoming place, and, like most of the palms we've met who are now living with waltzing Matilda, believes that here at last, his ship has come in. Yet, it might have been very different. The original governor of this new colony landed here exactly 200 years ago with the very first pommies. 736 convicts, men and women, together with some 300 marine guards and civilians. And six days afterwards, the French fleet sailed into Botany Bay under the insignia of Louis XVI. And if their navigator, de la Perouse, had just managed to get them here one week earlier. From every flagstaff in Australia today, they might be flying the French tricolour. And there'd be no Union Jack and Southern Cross, no Walsing Matilda, no cricket, no palms. Mm -hmm. 